la nostra prossima speaker, eh, Ruth Reich, eh, una delle figure più influenti del giornalismo gastronomico. Eh, oltre ad essere autrice di diversi libri, è stata um, criti critica dei ristoranti eh, per il New York Times e Los Angeles Times per tanti anni. E adesso Ruth eh, è alla ricerca ed è molto incuriosita sulla verità e cosa è la post-verità, specialmente da dove viene, gli Stati Uniti, eh, ma adesso possiamo parlare di questo come anche un fenomeno globale. Grazie Re. Well, I had a talk written for today in which I was going to talk about what is, in my opinion, the gravest danger facing food journalists, and that's the danger of telling the wrong stories. I was going to talk about how much we've muddied the waters by relating what seem like truths, only to find out a few years down the road that they were the wrong truths, that we'd been misled by science, by politics, by marketing. And that in the face of all the serious problems today, we have perhaps so confused the public that they're not listening to us anymore. I've been writing about food for 50 years. And lately I've been spending a lot of time thinking about the fact that we haven't done a very good job. We in the food press have confused the public by printing constantly contradictory stories. One year, butter is bad for you and everyone stops eating it. Then it turns out that margarines are even worse. Then eggs are a culprit, then they aren't. Gluten is terrible, well, maybe not so much. Salt, salt's the problem. Well, no, only 10% of the public is salt sensitive. Saturated fat is going to kill you. Oh no, maybe it won't. Sugar's the killer. After a while, people just stop listening. As writers like Marion Nessel have conclusively proved, we've been dreadfully manipulated by big food, who have not only paid researchers to do spurious studies, but also targeted writers and investigative, um, targeted scientists and investigative writers in an attempt to make sure that no bad news that might compromise their business ever leaks out. I was going to say that in these times more than ever, people need real news, news they can use to fix our broken food system. I think we can all agree that there has never been a time in human history when we were so much in need of the facts each time we sit down to eat. And you all know the problems. They're the ones that many of the candidates for the Basque World Culinary Prize are trying to solve, food waste, food distribution, hunger, poverty, obesity, the devastation of the oceans, carbon di dioxide, water, climate change, overuse of antibiotics. As everybody in this room is aware, food is threatened from everywhere. But I landed in Thursday, on, I landed in Italy on Thursday night to such devastating news that I just can't talk about that right now. I got off the plane to learn that my longtime friend and colleague, Jonathan Gold, was dying. And if there's anybody in this room who doesn't know who Jonathan was, um, he was at this moment, had been the restaurant critic of the LA Times for a long time, um, the only a uh, journalist ever to win a Pulitzer Prize for food, and someone I've been working with for almost my entire career. And when I found out that I would never see him again, actually exactly this time last year, Jonathan and his family and I were eating at Massimo's restaurant. Um, well, when I found out that I'd never see him again, I really haven't been able to think about anything but Jonathan for the past few days. And that's probably appropriate to this conference because the mission of this prize is to use gastronomy as an engine for change. And I don't think anyone ever did that better than Jonathan. 
And over the past few days, as I've watched the extraordinary outpouring of grief and love, I've been struck by how much has changed in the world. Jonathan's death was not only on the front page of the Los Angeles Times, but on, for two days it was on the front page of the New York Times, a paper he never wrote a single word for. And that's proof of how much food now matters to people and what a huge opportunity that is for all of us. Long before Tony Bourdain stepped out of the kitchen and onto the television screen, at a time when nobody in America, and I think few people in the world, understood the power of food, Jonathan got it. As far back as the early 80s, he was using restaurant criticism as a way to talk about much more than where we should eat. He understood, long before anyone was writing about it, the many ways that food creates community. In his hometown, Jonathan is revered as the person who little, literally put their food on the international map. In the documentary about him called City of Gold, a play on words that implies that he made the city, and the truth is that he did. Los Angeles is a confusing place, a huge sprawl divided into ethnic enclaves. In the early 80s, a Thai chef told me that he could live his whole life in LA without ever learning English because he could so easily stay inside the confines of his own community and do everything he needed to do in his own language. But it's precisely that quality that makes LA restaurants so remarkable. Chefs in LA are cooking for their own people and they have no need to water it down for an Anglo audience. What Jonathan did his brilliance was to lure his readers out of their own little safe territories. He had a message. Try other people's foods and maybe you'll discover not only that you like what they eat, but also that you like them. He wanted to make us curious about our neighbors and he instinctively knew that there was no better way to do it than through food. And through Jonathan, people discovered a formerly hidden city. And because of Jonathan, that city changed. As one chef wrote to me yesterday, he treated us and our food with respect and love and saw us as equals. Our food trucks, our holes in the walls, moms and pops, that was the true identity of Los Angeles. He saw it, he loved it, and he wanted us to succeed. He believed in us when not many people did. Well, Jonathan didn't start out as a food critic. Before he wrote about food, he was writing about music. This is how I've described our meeting in my upcoming book. In the early 80s, when I became the restaurant critic of the Los Angeles Times, I kept running into the same young, same young, young couple when I went out to eat. I wondered if they spent all their time in restaurants. You couldn't miss them. They were extremely conspicuous in the small Asian and Mexican restaurants they seemed to favor. He was pale and puffy with long thinning hair and the mushrooming complexion of someone who rarely sees the sun. She was tall with golden skin, wild black hair and a lean body that seemed to be all legs. No matter the weather, he wore a scuffed black motorcycle jacket while she favored bright prints and clashing colors. For months, we pointedly ignored each other. Then a waiter in some tiny Koreatown restaurant specializing in tofu insisted that we share a table. We were the only non-Asian patrons in the place, and the man refused to take no for an answer. Slowly, reluctantly, we began to talk. Jonathan Gold turned out to be the music critic of the city's alternative paper, but there seemed to be no subject on which he lacked an opinion. He was a classical cellist and rap music aficionado who was close to people with names like Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre. They actually had a name for him, Nervous Cuz. <laughs> he also claimed to have eaten in every taco stand in the city. I found this hard to believe, but it turned out to be true. Jonathan also knew a stunning amount about Thai and Korean food, and he could go on for hours about the distinctions between the foods of Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. 
I found him slightly pompous, irritating, and utterly fascinating. I was sure he felt the same way about me, minus the fascinating part. Sometimes during the 80s, Jonathan gave up writing about music and turned exclusively to food. It wasn't just that he loved eating out, which God knows he did, but he'd begun to understand the power of food for a writer. Yes, he could and did tell you in excruciating detail about the one restaurant that specialized in the food of Oaxaca and which place in Koreatown served only Korean black goat soup. But he was different than the other people who were writing about ethnic restaurants, which was actually a term that he loathed. And not merely because the quality of his writing was so good that sometime, someone once told me that he was, quote, much too good to be wasted on a food critic. And it wasn't just his enormous respect for each cuisine. What set Jonathan apart was that he never lost sight of the fact that when he was writing about food, he was really writing about much more. He was writing about people. And he passed it on. I just edited this year's edition of Best American Food Writing. As I read through the hundreds of stories, one theme kept recurring over and over. Young writers began their pieces by saying, I want to be the next Jonathan Gold. Reading through the entries, I began to understand exactly what that meant. It meant that food writing has changed. When I started my career, Food writing was extremely polite. Not anymore. The sound of modern food writing is angry, raucous, impolite. It embraces class and gender. It asks difficult questions. The new sound of food writing is muscular, it's passionate, and it understands its own power. That this, this kind of writer, that these young food writers our intent on making change is very much thanks to Jonathan. Because he not only showed us a new way of looking at food, but also proved that you don't need television or a movie to make an impact. Every time he sat down to write, he proved the power of words. I know there are a lot of writers in this room, and I hope that you'll all remember Jonathan's most important legacy. What Jonathan showed us more than anything, is what food writing can do. In the hands of a passionate, talented writer, words can become powerful weapons. Last week, when I was thinking about what I was going to talk about today, I was convinced that what we needed was more investigative writers telling us the truth. And that's certainly true. But now, in the face of Jonathan's death, death I see that sometimes it's the softest words that make the biggest impact. Jonathan wrote delicious dishes in far, Jonathan wrote about delicious dishes in far-flung neighborhoods. He never wrote a single overtly political word. He didn't do investigative writing. And yet, he touched millions of people and changed an entire city. Those of us who want to change the world would do well to remember that sometimes it's the stories that seem very small that are really the biggest ones of all. Thank you.